thank you, everyone. Um, this is a, a big topic we're talking about here, the future of food. So, and we've got a limited amount of time. So once again, if you have questions as the panelists are talking, if you can just DM me on Twitter, at M-A-R-I-W-R-I-T-E-S, that's at Mary Wrights, then I will get to as many of your questions as we can at the end. So to this panel, the future of food, we could talk about a bazillion different things. But what we're going to focus on today are real world solutions to some of the really difficult challenges facing us as we try to feed ourselves and our growing population. So I'm very honored today to have these three panelists. Uh, my friend Mary Berry from the Berry Center in Henry County, Kentucky is the daughter of Wendell and Tanya Berry. I'm sure you all know Wendell, <laughs> of Wendell. Um, the Berry Center is a nonprofit dedicated to the work of changing the industrial ag system back to one that uses nature as a standard, accepts no permanent damage to the ecosystem, and takes into consideration human health in local communities. <laughs> Mary is the eighth generation of her family to farm in Henry County, and she's the executive director of the center. Uh, like her father, she's also a respected speaker and author. <laughs> um, we, have, we have Dusty Downey. He is the conservation ranching lead for Audubon Rockies. He oversees all aspects of Audubon's conservation ranching initiative across the Rockies region, including certification, marketing, science, and outreach. He's a working rancher along with his wife and two daughters in Northeast Wyoming. And Lance Wheeler is the owner of Rafter W Ranch. <clears throat> Excuse me. Lance, his wife Lisa, and their family raise grass-fed beef and lamb and pastured poultry on their ranch in Simla, Colorado. They use the principles of holistic management and sell their products direct to consumers in the region. They're passionate about building relationships to ensure the future of locally raised food and vibrant communities. So it's a, it's a diverse group, lots of interesting perspectives here. So let's jump into the first question. In his 1977 book, The Unsettling of America, Wendell Berry rails against the corporate takeover of agriculture. And if you haven't read that book, if you're at all interested in our food systems, it's, it's a must read. He writes, the cost of this corporate totalitarian, totalitarianism <laughs> in energy, land, and social disruption will be enormous. Keep in mind, this is 1977. It will lead to the exhaustion of farmland and farm culture. Husbandry will become an extractive industry because maintenance will entirely give way to production. The fertility of the soil will become a limited, unrenewable resource like coal or oil. This may not happen. It need not happen. But it is necessary to recognize it can happen. And now, 45 years later, it has happened and much worse. Despite the effort of all the various components of the food and environmental movements. So the question is, how do we, how do we begin to find our way back to a sustainable, equitable, and healthy way of feeding ourselves? And Mary, we'll start with you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Marilyn. It's been lovely to be here. I have enjoyed the day and learned a lot, and I thank you. I thank you, and congratulations to the edible communities on 20 years of good work. Um, I think that um, for, for people, I'm gonna lump us all into a group and say people like us, who think about food and talk about food and um, uh, live with this every day, we forget sometimes that maybe one of our big problems is that there's too much food. 
were covered up with food. And so when food is plentiful, food is the last thing on people's minds. When food becomes scarce, it will be the first. And so what I think at the Berry Center, I think what I've been hearing from people all day on the panels, what I know I'm going to hear from my friends on this stage, is that we're trying to come up under what's coming apart with something solid. At the Berry Center, we're basing our work on the culture of a particular place. Um, my father says about the work of the Berry Center that he, he likes that we have begun the work right where we are. He says, and I'm going to mangle this quote, but um, he says that global solutions that don't work locally won't work anywhere. But a local solution that will actually work might work other places. So we've begun that work at the Berry Center, and I know many of you have done this very same thing. You've done the good work that's right in front of you to do. And I feel myself surrounded by friends and allies, and that's not all that usual, and I thank you for that. But our work at the Berry Center is to make quality pay. To make, uh, to make good farming pay. We've talked a lot about labels today, certifications, and so on. I long for the day, and I will be long dead when it happens, that we can, in particular places, talk about good farming, and the people around us will know what we're talking about. That will mean that we have a culture again. And the culture will not look the same all over the United States of America or all over the world. It will look different in different places. And by the way, we, uh, I, I talk about farms, and I seem to end up in the West a lot talking to people who uh, our 100-acre farms are, I think, looked down on. <laughs> but, but I'm just assuming. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. But anyway, uh, so the, I think the work of the Berry Center that, is, that we have four programs at the Berry Center to work on the, to, put, to try to put an economy under good farming, but also to create a culture that will support good farming. Um, and I think the one that, that, we'll, that maybe we'll want to talk about today is our program called Our Home Place Meat. It's based on the, uh, the tobacco program that, was, uh, that kept small farmers, small diversified farmers on their homes for generations. Uh, tobacco is a problem. No question, and I do not speak favorably for tobacco. What, I, what I'm talking about now is the program written by, by my grandfather that matched up supply in order to maintain a parity price. Therefore, it kept good land users in place, and it passed a good farm culture from generation to generation, and it also land passed from generation to generation. So... Um, I think, I believe that um, we need to think about those things if we want to change the culture of agriculture. I think we better stop talking about movements and we better start talking about cultural change. Movements seem to live kind of up here while the economy rolls on underneath them. Um, I am extremely interested in the Audubon program because finally, people interested in conservation, which I, I certainly am and think some things should not be used. But the conservation movement, the environmental movement has said we will either set aside and save or, or we'll just let the rest of it go to hell. Um, and the rest of it being working lands and working people. So um, I'm not sure what the question was, <laughs> but I, f I feel like it's been totally answered, and we can move on. <laughs> you want me to go? You want to go? Me? So, uh, oh, shit. apparently I have a damn loud voice. 
I'll hold that at an angle here. I guess just to, to kind of, you know, bring it back around to, to personal stories on this, you know, I remember, so I'm going to date myself here, age myself a little bit, but, you know. Don't worry about I, it. <laughs> you know, I remember one of the big things on the ranch was the folks said, you know, get off the ranch, go away, go do something. If you want to come back to the ranch someday, you can. We'll come back and we'll, we'll provide good food for, for the people that are out there. We've got this ranching business to, to take care of. But I remember when I came back after college and after kind of jumping around in a few years and, and telling my father that I was now working for a conservation organization, the National Audubon Society. And I remember how that conversation went. Now, fast forward 20 years to now, my old man's the one out there, and this is, this is the man who, he, he was a bull rider, mom was out there running around with him, you know, I mean, I, I don't think that was even something in their scope of thought at that point. I think they, they didn't quite realize the, the, the services they were providing as, as land managers. And 20 years now, you know, dad's out bird watching on the ranch. And he's out really invested in the conservation practices and the management that we are trying to do on the ranch to improve the land. And so I think back to that cultural shift, what I would like to see is for my kids who I'm going to be, I'm, I'm going to be totally honest here, I've got a vegetarian daughter who wants to come back to the ranch, not to sell meat, not to provide food, but because of the environmental movement. She understands that the protection of that land will rely on those cattle that are out there because that's how that land is managed best. But she's also got that drive to do something for the environment and, and ultimately something for the community that we live in and around that community. And so it's, it's amazing to see that, that cultural shift of you know, ranching or farming, whatever it is, providing food to now it is an environmental movement. Where else would you see, you know, cowboy hats maybe at a nature conservancy meeting? Or where else would you see, you know, uh, you know, somebody from the nature conservancy coming to a ranching workshop? Right? We are in a movement here, and it's just a really exciting time. And so I know sometimes we get caught up in the minutia of supply chains and different things, and yes, that's there. There are definitely difficulties, but there are also some really wonderful solutions out there. And there are brilliant people working on those solutions, whether it be the Berry Center, the Rocky Mountain Food Collaborative that's out here in Denver that's doing great things with food hubs, whether it's Audubon or Nyman or whoever it is, I think there's optimism to be had there. We all know that this is going slowly, but it's going in the right direction. Um, so I, I, what I would add to this conversation, I think, is um, looking through the lens of a land manager. And, and we dove into ecology and soil health and ecosystems. We found that there are relationships that occur in those spaces and for things to be healthy above those, that you have to build those, those relationships below the ground. And I feel that um, those can inform our relationships in this pursuit. And we need all of those pieces to be functioning healthfully, right? Whether that you know, are the, the larger companies from Nyman to uh, butcher box to um, any other company, but we also need the intermediaries and we need the the medium size and even small size pieces you know to function properly for the whole system to be healthful um, and we learn that in soil ecology because we're the, the ecology is dependent on some of the smallest components and if we remove those things um, things begin to fall apart and degrade and so we want to build those things locally, regionally, nationally, but we need all of them to be functioning optimally for everyone to succeed. I think uh, to add to that, I think what we're talking about is reconnecting things that never should have been disconnected. And um, our in I think, I believe, some people might want to argue with me about it, but I think our problem is industrialism. Industrialism has taken apart, to repeat myself, what should never have been taken apart. And so what we're talking about here is bringing back together the urban and the rural places. But this time, let's think a little about the rural places. Um, 
I think we're, uh, to, and to do that, I think we're going to have to face the fact that we've never settled America. We've colonized it. We're going to have to figure out how to actually live here and do as little harm as possible. Um, the whole industrialized food system is simply pushing the cost to the future. Um, and, and I think that's coming home. Uh, well, I know it is. It's coming home to roost for people like me who live in a particular place and have my entire life. I've not been able, I think many of you feel the same about your places. I have never wanted to live anywhere but Henry County, Kentucky. I was just born that way. I used to, when I was a little girl, I used to feel so sorry for people who didn't live in Henry County, Kentucky. <laughs> well, you can imagine that uh, some people were surprised to find out that I felt like, I, like people who live in Manhattan felt I was shocked by the way I felt about Henry County. But anyway, um, but I, I think we're t to do what we want to do, we've got to reconnect. And, then, and to do that, we've got to change the standard. Our standard has been cheap and efficient. Now the standard has to be health. I cannot see what else it could be. What else brings the whole into mind? Um, so. <laughs> so, Mary, when we talked before, you mentioned that farmers seem to fall into two categories these days. The mega farmers, the corporate people, who, you know, in many cases are suits in office buildings somewhere, they're not actually farming, or the small entrepreneurial farmers you know, the, the people who have come back to the land, who maybe have a small, small operation, but there's not much in the middle. I think farmers uh, in our country today have two choices. And one is to be large and industrial, and the other is to be small and entrepreneurial. And as Marilyn said, and there's almost nothing in the middle. Our meat program is trying to put something in the middle to, make, to think of uh, paying farmers a fair price first and to take care of uh, marketing and um, distribution and pricing and so on. Um, first of all, what I've seen happen since 2017, and we're so new and we're so small, but uh, things are going well, what I've seen happen with the group of farmers that we're working with, young farmers, uh, most of them are younger, th under 35. Um, these are passionate, committed, good land users. My father picked the first members of the group. Um, what I've seen is that they've changed from being price takers to thinkers. And this is what we've got to do to change the agriculture in this country. We've uh, We've just, well, first of all, since the 50s, when it was stated that our, U, our USDA-backed agricultural policy was that we had too many farmers and that we needed to get rid of, well, evidently, almost all of them. Um, the USDA has never retracted that, and they, have, and they have never said how few or too few. Well, I think we're there. Um, so where was I going with that? Um, <laughs> Here, you go with it. Well, I, I, think, I think it's an important component. So we're, we're putting them into two categories, right? The small versus the industrialization. And I think the, the key component to that is the entrepreneurial spirit of those who are on those small farms and ranches. And so, you know, what I think about when I think about that, that entrepreneurial spirit is, is really is diversity. And I would say as part of Audubon, that has always been the cornerstone of our message, whether it's diversity of habitat. So, you know, how do we make some lands have the diversity that is needed to, to provide that open space for birds and the other wildlife? Or is it the diversity of, of you know, what folks are going to do to be able to make some money? And so this is where, I mean, 20 years ago, I would have never even 
popped into my head that ecotourism could be a way to be able to supplement income on a farm or a ranch. I would have never considered the fact that, yeah, it's great to have an apiary on the ranch because that's also some income that gets to come into the ranch. And it's providing an eco, you know, a, a service, an ecosystem service by being out there as pollinators. And so I think that's one of the big things that I think about is, is you know, to, to Lance's point as well, those small and medium-sized farms and ranches need to have diversity there to be successful. And I think that's where we all come in is to help kind of provide that guiding light on where there's places that, that really can be taken advantage of um, and, and really help those producers out in that smaller setting versus that huge industrial complex, which is really just going to be geared towards one thing. Right? Make it fast, make it big, make a lot of money. And I think that's, that's something that we think about a lot within, within our programs. I think what I would add to that too, in, in the interest of diversity, is in also a mechanism for future generations. And we were talking about Gen Z earlier this week, and they are, they're very innovative thinkers. And so offering opportunities to either your family members or even those that are not members of your family to start an enterprise on your place. You may be running cattle, but maybe they want to run chickens or sheep or something else. Um, and, and build a diverse offering from the, same, from the same operation and diversify the people that are providing it. I am... Um I'm interested in how the entrepreneurial spirit fits into this discussion, and here's why. Um, I think, from my perspective, in my highly marginal uh, place, uh, rolling countryside, small farms, I think that entrepreneurial agriculture has gone about as far as it can go. Um, and it certainly is not keeping up with rural decline. Um, I grew up under a federal program that was, I, it was written by my grandfather, and it was a Depression era program. It was a price support, not a subsidy, but it protected farmers in the marketplace. A few buyers, many producers, what's going to happen um, if, if you flood the marketplace? I mean, overproduction is the singular cruelty of our industrial agriculture. Um, because landholders were stable, because they were um, highly diversified, um, because they were making a little money from a lot of places, which are sort of what you are both talking about, um, they were independent. So I would say they had an entrepreneurial spirit. But all that rested on the stable economy that was the tobacco economy. Now, the tobacco economy meant that uh, when I first started farming in 1981, my then husband and I, but that's another panel, had, uh, uh, had a 200-acre farm with a five-acre tobacco base. So the very, f the, the, um, least erodible places on the farm were plowed, and around that was what I call a perennial agriculture, forage crops, permanent pasture, and so on. So there was an economic backstop for very good land use. And the, and the thing that uh, makes my friend Lois Matus and I cry when we talk about it is our memory of people working together. So tobacco crops were brought in. This is probably different than out west where people are, are a, little, a little farther apart. But uh, it, took, it took farmers a bit out of the uh, money economy to some extent. My father says that until everybody's tobacco crop was in, nobody's was considered in. And I don't mean the entire county, but I mean one ridge, one neighborhood. And so... Our home place meet, uh, my hope for home place meet, uh, rests on that memory, the memory of what can happen when, and then you have independent thinking people. Um, and the result of the loss of that has been the, uh, the terrible um, 
political climate we're in, um, you know, people mad at all the wrong people as far as I'm concerned, but anyway, um, so, so I'm interested in entre entrepreneurial spirit, but I don't want our farmers in head-to-head -head competition. The worst, the most, uh, the angry, some of the angriest places I've ever been were the farm markets that I went to for years. And um, somebody said to me, I was on a panel sometime recently, and somebody said, but Mary, the farmers at the farmer's market are so happy. And I said, well, some, you know, I benefited from the local food movement, and that made me happy. But some of that's performance art, and that's all there is to it. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're fighting for the same market. So. Okay. Go. Yeah, no. Yeah, no. I can I can respect that, and I can think of that, and I think what it what what it brings what it brings back around for me is the fact that yes, if Lance and I are selling a product in an area that's relatively close to one another, that product being let's just say beef, we are going to be at loggerheads. We're we're probably going to be in that direct competition. But what makes us different is that I think our values have changed. And er, not our values have changed, excuse me. Our values align with what we are trying to do. I look for Lance to have success selling his product because that means that what he is doing on the land aligns with the values that are important to me, which is protecting the land, protecting the birds, the wildlife that's out there. And so I think there's a little bit more value proposition out there for farmers and ranchers to connect. And I think a big part of, of uh, you know, Audubon and a lot of the other organizations out there is, is really making those connections within that group. It isn't direct competition. We all do want the same thing. And ultimately, you know, it's that age old saying of a rising tide, uh, you know, will bring up all ships or however the hell it goes. So I think, you know, if we're all at least somewhat aligned in our values, I think we're all going to be able to, to there's going to be some competition there, but I think ultimately we're all going to be able to, to rise on that ship. So I, I like what Mary shared, and, and I think that the idea that we shed the, our, our competitive nature and take up the interest of the other. Right, so if I'm on the phone with Dusty, what I should be thinking about is how can I help Dusty succeed? And I can assure you, Dusty's had that same thought when he's been on the phone with me. And um, I, I think we need to adopt that team concept across the spectrum, right? And, and I've actually spoken with people from Colorado to South Africa this, this summer over agriculture, how do we get to the next place, what can I add to my operation, and those kinds of things. And you, you know, it's never, it should never for me, or in my opinion, anyone else be, how can I beat them to the punch if they're thinking about it? And it should be, how can I help them get to the place, they, they, that next place, so they can be successful, because ultimately we're all on the same team. And do you find that that attitude is common in farming and ranching, or is that kind of a, are you outliers? I think it's becoming more common in, if, you, if we want to call it the regenerative agricultural world. Um, the, I still have many friends in the, in the, in the industrial world, and, and competition rules the day. Um, but um, even when I talk with them, you know, sometimes we're, we're going across the same bridges or we're dealing with the same issues, whether it's weather or something else. So how can I help you get to the next place? How can I help you get through the, through the crisis? Right? And, and that hopefully will feed back at some point in time. Yeah, and I think it just kind of speaks to that here that we've got, you know, we've got Nyman ranches, we've got Panorama ranches, all that have 30 to 100 ranches that are involved in that network. They're all aligned in the values. There's a reason they're with that. There's a reason there's over 100 ranches in the Audubon certification. Like, they're, 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 you know, when you start thinking about it on that scale, that there are thousands of farms and ranches across there that do collaborate and do look at ways like food hubs or they look at ways to, to really push a message of, of whatever their values are 
it's bigger, I think, than we want to give it credit for sometime. I think that is, you know, back to, to Mary's point, not, not just a movement. I think there is a cultural shift there. Great, great. So can you guys tell me a little bit about the Rocky Mountain Collaborative? Tell me what you're doing there. <laughs> well, you can't. <laughs> So the Rocky Mountain Food Collaborative is a, a local effort um, in the Rocky Mountain region, it's based here in Denver, uh, to coalesce um, high, that high quality proteins, vegetables, and other things we've been discussing today, uh, and bring them to a space where we can bridge the rural-urban divide, reach into food deserts, reach into communities, um, and, and reconnect, right? And to say, that actually, we're in this together. We, we, we don't live geographically that distant from each other. And at the end of the day, we need each other. And, you know, so we're, as far as ran, on, from the rancher side, we're looking at this and saying, we recognize that, that you don't have access to this, this quality of food, and we're willing to do the work to, to knock down that barrier and get it there. And we need you, as, as the consumer in those spaces, to do your part so that we can continue to do that and branch into other spaces. And that's one of the prime values of the Rocky Mountain Food Collaborative is, is to do that. Great. So probably everybody in here at some point has shopped in a farmer's market, bought food through their local CSA, and you feel good about that because, you know, you're helping out your local farmers. But is that enough? Is there more that us urban people could be doing to support farmers? Um, we have an education program at the Berry Center uh, that's granting an undergraduate degree in farming. Uh, it's called the Wendell Berry Farming Program, much to Wendell Berry's, well, he's not pleased, but anyway. Yeah, I, I wasn't sure what else to name it. <laughs> um, and our idea, of course, is to, uh, to, to take up where the culture has failed. The culture, we, I, I would, you know, the, the big tragedy of my father's book, The Unsettling of America, that Marilyn cited when we began, is that it's relevant today. He's, uh, I think it's in its fourth or fifth edition, I don't remember how many, but in several forwards or afterwards or whatever, Daddy has said, uh, I wish this, was, this book was irrelevant, that it was gone. But it, I've, I recently read it again, and it, might, it could have been written yesterday. Um, so... What I wish is that the Berry Center, um, I, I am enjoy my work, and as a matter of fact, after a life of, of uh, I was a full-time farmer until I started the Berry Center. My husband is still a full, my now husband is still a full-time farmer, um, all by himself most of the time. Um, but what I, I wish that the work that we were doing was not necessary to do. Um, so what we're trying to do with the Wendell Berry Farming Program is to train farmers in the way that the culture used to train um, farmers. I mean, the, the information was passed on from generation to generation. This turns out to be essential, not nostalgic or sweet, but essential. How are we going to live here? How are we going to learn to live uh, on this place and do as little harm as possible? Not live each year at the next year's expense. But as far as I'm concerned, uh, of course farmers should be agrarians, um, should think as agrarians. But as far as I'm concerned, we all better become agrarians. We better think of the health of the land, the health of everything. And we better think about what's brought us to this point. Um, one of the things that we're dealing with with the farming program is trying to counter education for upward mobility. We're saying education is not to get out of physical work. Um, it's, it's, education is to learn how to be a 
a good citizen, to do good work. Um, what are people for? Well, we better try to figure that one out. Um, so I think that giving, because we eat every day, um, we better consider ourselves um, that we haven't, we, we've given our proxies over to the industrial food system. We've said, you take care of it. Well, that's not all right. And um, I know that, that I'm, as someone said earlier today, preaching to the choir, but um, you know, often the choir doesn't know as much as the choir thinks it knows. I mean, I, I do think that, that my job at the Berry Center has been to travel around some and tell people that what they think is happening is not happening. Um, the culture of agriculture in this country is still dominated by industrial agriculture. That's all there is to it. It's just the truth. Um, and it doesn't matter how many farm markets and farm-to-table restaurants and so on um, exist. Somebody, as you all have done, and as we've seen from, or heard from other farmers and people today, we've got to intentionally put things in place that will support people who can use our land well. And if people can afford to use the land well, in my experience, they will. And not only that, but to your point, they will encourage people coming after them to do the same. And one more thing we've got, we better think about is our, um, our uh, well, <laughs> prejudice against country people, country places. I mean, um, uh, you could call somebody a redneck and a hick all day long. And um, we've had that prejudice against people who work hard with their bodies and their minds. Well, it turns out working with your bodies and your minds might be the way to live a healthy life. But um, anyway, my father thinks it's hilarious that people go uh, to health clubs. Um, <laughs> And avoid, but um, anyway, was that? A, that's it. That's all I have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What I what I would say along with that is is I think it's really important for you all through your means and your resources that you have through your publications or whatever it is. It's really important for consumers to truly understand that what they buy has meaning and it has a power that is far and above what they get home to feed to their family, right? If they've got two different products in front of them and one is environmentally conscious and the other is not, and they purchase the environmentally conscious one for a few cents more, that isn't just that they paid a few cents more. That is coming back into the system that is ultimately going you know, to have a huge amount of power if lots of people purchase that. And so I think that's kind of, of one of those things that's, that's really important to put out there is that, that the purchase of a consumer should mean something. It shouldn't just be an empty purchase. There should be things behind it. You know, and, and again, as a consumer, it's important to be fairly skeptical of some things, right? And that's the job of the consumer is to go out there and find out what aligns with your values. And, and as we've heard all day today, there's the greenwashing out there, and we've heard all day today, you know, that third-party verification like Audubon's, like the other ones that are out there, that is critical. Right, that is critical to back up what you say, and and there's programs out there like ours that also not only back it up, but they back it up with good science behind it as well. And so, if you really truly want to see the data that says we're doing the right thing and we stand behind it, you can ask for that science, and you know Aaron back there will provide that for you. All right, and so there is definitely power in purchasing, and I think that's important. And the way we try to foster that, you know, uh, idea that there's power in purchasing, when we meet our customer, or we make a delivery, or we do those things, we actually thank them for being actually part of our team so that we can continue the work. All right, how much time do we have? Five minutes. Okay, it looks like Twitter's been a bit quiet, but I know you guys must have questions. So if anybody wants to come up to the mics and ask a question, that would be great. Hi, my name is Margaret. 
Okay, my name is Margaret um, with the Rocky Mountain Food Collaborative, and we've been talking about kind of microcosms of a lot of really great projects, and I was wondering if I could raise it back to the systems level and just ask each of you, or whoever has time, if you could really have one thing that you could kind of immediately change within our current system to kind of hijack the direction we're going, what would you select? Am I now the queen of the world? Is it that kind of answer? I'd get rid of the big box discount right now if I were the, you know, able to do anything. I'll let them answer, then I'll come back with a real answer. <laughs> okay. Oh, great. We'll think for a minute. Um, if, if I could change, if I could ultimately change one thing, I think, I think it would be the fact that, yes, kind of back to what we talked about earlier, but I, th I think it would be that we're better at working together to, solu to, to find solutions. And we're looking at all the diverse ranges of, of point of views and everything else, and we had a better ability to sit down and, and have, a con have a constructive conversation to to really solve a problem and so and that may mean that we need to sit down with big egg and talk about how what we're doing is important and really push that that message of you know they need to come towards us we're not going to go their way but we need them to come towards us and and really find you know find an environmentally conscious solution that that serves the purpose of all I, I think if I could change, I could change one thing. Um, it would be the, you know, it would be the production model. You know, like we to bring that back down to earth into its natural form, um, and have things be interconnected and not so, not so separate. Um, and. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure how else to articulate that, but it, but it, but it is to say, um, we've just segmented it into different pieces and parts, and now it's disjointed and it's dysfunctional. Now we need to bring it back into normative function, uh, so that it can be what it should be. I think it's almost impossible to answer with one thing. Um, I. There are many things that I wish could happen, but I don't see it as, I mean, in, broadly speaking, I, I really wish that we would begin to be a culture of people who, who stop thinking the cavalry's coming and who start working right where they are. And figure out where they are. This is going to be, this is a terrible answer to this question, but I'm going to go on with it. Um, we started the Berry Center with an inventory of what we had to work with, which means we've got something left of a pretty good farm culture. We've got a well-watered landscape. We've got some um, good small farmers who are raising beef cattle beautifully. And I could spend the rest of the day talking about that. Um, we have access to some markets, um, et cetera. But ta taking an inventory of what you've got to work with, which is, I think, what people have been talking about all day, means that you begin to go to work not from the ground up, not from the top down. You see, you're working with what you actually have. So you begin to work in particularities, not in the abstract. And once you go to work, um, once we started our home place meet or the reading programs in Henry County or the uh, farm program at, and the other things that we do, then the problems began, the, the questions and the problems we needed to solve became particular. So we got out of that place where so many of us, where we all can be, if we're just thinking, oh my God, things are terrible and it's awful and we better fix it quickly. I think it's better to think, what do we got right here? Um, what we need is here. We've just got to figure out what it is we actually need and then go to work, I think. One thing. 
All right. Are we done? Awesome. Done. Thank you so much. It was fabulous.